Okay, so uh, um, this is uh, um, a group of us at, at UBC, um, a number of people here you're probably familiar with, uh, um, beyond myself, uh, including Harry Nelson, who's an economist who's bringing actually more of his expertise into this third phase of the project, as I'll show you. All right, so what I want to do here is discuss a bit of the model structure, uh, talk about how we put it together, uh, and subsequently how we've validated this model. Um, how we've taken it to run a few Alberta scenarios, including assessing the efficacy of control efforts, as well as alternative control um, strategies that might be uh, relevant. Um, talk about some of the results, and then ultimately, as I mentioned to you, we'll go into a little bit of detail with, with regards where we're taking this by way of next steps. Okay, so mountain pine beetle spread is the model, uh, and it's uh, effectively a spatially explicit model uh, that works on a forested landscape that is uh, divided into cells, 16 hectare cells. Um, it actually is capable of projections into the future of one or two decades. And what it does is it calculates from one year to the next mountain pine beetle reproduction and associated pine mortality within a given 16 hectare cell. And it also, and, and most importantly, calculates the probability of colonization from an occupied cell to a suitable, uh, uh, but, uh, suitable but unoccupied recipient cell. Uh, from year to year. It's a stochastic model, and this means that colonization events are triggered as binary events, either they're colonized or they're not, by a randomization process. And so we're able to actually run this thing through in a Monte Carlo sort of format and produce means and standard errors or, or confidence intervals around the means. Okay, a bit more detail on model structure. As I said, it calculates the probability of successful colonization of an unoccupied cell in a given year. And I'm going to show you that, but then I'm not going to dwell on that because I don't think you need to worry too much about the math. Instead, um, I'll just show you that it calculates here PIT, which we're referring to as the probability of successful colonization of an occupied cell, uh, I, in year T. And that's all calculated as a function of habitat quality, and I'll talk about that in a bit more detail as we go forward. A beetle export factor, which I'll give some details on shortly the wind, the directional winds that we've got uh, here east of the Rockies, as well as a distance weighting factor to account for the vagaries of dispersal over a landscape. So to talk about each of these in turn, I'll show you this. So our habitat quality is essentially calculated as a function of the percentage of susceptible pine, its age, its density, and location factor, which is derived from the R model, which you may or may not have heard of that we've uh, developed previously. So it's extracted from the location uh, uh, temperature effect in that particular model. The beetle export factor, we uh, derive this function simply because when a particular stand is first colonized uh, and, it, and it's full of susceptible trees, the likelihood of beetles leaving that stand after a, an, an, uh, the first year of colonization is low, but increases as the productivity of that uh, particular infestation increases itself, and then falls off again as the highly susceptible and most suitable trees are exploited, and the, the beetle productivity declines as a consequence. So that's what the beetle export factor is about. Our wind scaler, as I mentioned before, is effectively just calculating uh, the directionality of the wind based upon meteorological stations that are um, scattered across the province. And then our distance weighting factor, as I said, to account for the vagaries associated with dispersing over long distances. So the model uh, begins this way. It begins by calculating the probability of infestation for all cells in a given year. And then what we do is from that, we translate those probabilities into whether or not a cell was successfully colonized. And that's what you're looking at here. So that's the way the model begins to spool up. What we can do there, and what we actually really focused on when we first began this particular effort, was to see if we can include in this control efforts, implement the controls and see what those have in terms of effects on the probability of colonization uh, within particular cells. And so we implement controls based upon a rule base. And these rule bases are derived from the current slow the spread strategy being implemented by Alberta Ag and Forestry. And so we have level one, where cells in an infestation uh, are treated. Um, and they're treated if they're detected within a couple of years of establishment. And level two, which is the clear-cut harvesting approach, which has to do with cells that are, have infestations that are more, are more than three years of age um, or duration, and within seven kilometers or so from a road, because beyond that, we decide that, uh, that these uh, infestations are unlikely to be treated. 
We apply these rules in the following way. We use our leading edge focus, again, attempting to emulate the approach that's being currently employed by um, Alberta Ag and Forestry. So we begin with cells that are at the easternmost longitude and the highest latitude, and then what we do is just work sequentially westward from there. And we continue until all cells uh, have been treated or we run out of resources for treatment, depending upon whatever we're, scenario we're applying. A couple of notes to make on that front is that each infested cell has a probability of one, being detected, and two, uh, successfully being eradicated from the point of view of the, of the infestation. And so in the case of level one applications, all or a proportion of the green attack is removed, and that's set by a, a parameter called P eradicate that we, we define in advance of the runs. The level two treatments, of course, being a clear-cut harvesting application means that all trees are removed from a, a given cell. So before I move into some of the scenarios then, I wanted to sort of point out some of the real strong features of this approach and of this model that we're running. So we have uh, a model, MPP spread, that's accounting, accounting for infested trees at the standard landscape level. Uh, it's dealing with stand susceptibility. It can handle tree mortality. Um, it deals with mountain pine beetle product, uh, reproductive output, including the, the, uh, the beetle export factor, which includes climatic effects by way of that location factor that I mentioned before. Uh, it deals with habitat connectivity dispersal and control efforts. So let's talk about some validation. So the idea that we had was we'd go forth and see what we could do by way of validation. So we took the model back to BC uh, where we had uh, um, a significant amount of data and an area in which we could work. So we chose central BC. We seeded the model with survey data from 1999, which BC Flynn Row provided to us. And then we ran 10 model runs, which were used to define the mean and the confidence intervals. And we conditioned the model to account for experienced pine. So in other words, based upon the literature, we know that uh, beetles reproducing in pines with a long evolutionary experience with mountain pine beetle tend to produce fewer offspring per female than do naive pines. And so we conditioned the model for the, um, the experienced pine. The results from the, the validation are actually really encouraging in the sense that uh, we had very good concordance uh, with the survey data based upon the area of, col of colonization uh, through time. Wasn't quite so good in terms of estimating cumulative mortality, um, but if we ran it beyond the simple 10 years there, I'm sure you can see that things would converge further out towards the end. Probably a consequence of the high levels of uh, positive feedback in a massive outbreak that, uh, that was ongoing at the time. So based upon the validation, we had uh, um, a really solid uh, foundation on which we could move forward and begin to look at some of the things going on in Alberta. So we took this now back to Alberta, having followed through with our validation. And we began asking questions about whether or not uh, spread through Alberta um, has been managed by the, uh, the slow to spread activities. And so what we did was we ran a scenario whereby we considered the slow to spread strategy and the area colonized. And then, of course, we wanted to know if we're getting anywhere near what was actually being recorded by way of survey data. And sure enough, we were. So again, we, we feel good that the model is performing in the way that it should in a realistic fashion. So then we asked the question whether or not the current slow the spread approach to mountain pine beetle management is actually um, doing anything by way of comparison with a do-nothing approach. And so to that, we actually compared what the model would have produced a scenario in the absence of any interventions on the part of Alberta Ag and Forestry. And sure enough, there's a significant increase in the amount of area occupied uh, based upon the do-nothing approach when compared to the slow to spread. So that's very encouraging, and we're using this to sort of suggest uh, very strongly that the efforts to date have actually certainly produced uh, a very realistic uh, uh, reduction in spread by mountain pine beetle across the province. But given that we could do this, we thought, well, why not add a few more scenarios to the mix? And so what we did is we thought we'd compare what would happen if we doubled the amount of clear-cut harvesting applied against mountain pine beetle based upon a rule base. And interesting enough, very little effect, if any at all. And this is not altogether surprising because if you think about it, clear-cut harvesting is applied to an infestation after it has developed sufficiently that it's already starting to produce dispersers. And so in this particular case, it's unlikely to have a real big impact upon spread at all. However, if we just doubled the amount of treatment by way of single tree treatments, a level one approach, you can see that significant amounts of area are protected by doubling up on the level one applications. Not much happens if we're actually increasing detection and eradication efforts simply because it's all about level one anyways. But here's the Cadillac version, that if you can actually uh, double up on your level one applications, ramp up your level two applications, 
and increase your ability at detection and eradication, you can actually reduce even further the amount of area colonized. All right, so based upon this, I just wanted to summarize some of these results before describing where we're going as we go forward. Uh, first of all, the model is providing pretty realistic projections of annual mountain pine beetle spread under the ongoing slow to spread strategy employed here in the province. The strategy itself has significantly reduced spread relative to model do-nothing scenarios. Single tree treatments are more effective than clear-cut harvesting at slowing the spread, and again, I'm not surprised by this simply because in the case of a habitat invasion and spread, the earlier you act, the more effective you're going to be. We know that is pretty much an axiom from invasion biology. But it's worth pointing out too that significant improvements can be achieved with increased efforts whether they're logistically or economically feasible is another question altogether. So in terms of going forward, what I'm calling our freight phase three of this project, there's a number of things that we want to do. First of all, we want to recast mountain pine beetle spread or the MPB spread model to encompass the entire province. You might have noticed that the map I showed you previously was restricted to largely that area in, in the central portions of the uh, province. And we chose that area specifically because we had good solid data uh, to work with. So we're going to scale it up to the province as a whole. We're going to consider spread through all of Alberta's pine forests. We're going to incorporate some economic considerations. And I mentioned off the top that Harry Nelson at UBC is going to help with that. And uh, Mike Underschultz has been providing uh, uh, data to Harry uh, uh, quite consistently over the last couple of months. We're going to assess the effects of net down. And we define this as the potential influence of land units where mountain pine beetle is, uh, management is precluded. And so we're talking things like parks, caribou habitat, military reserves. Um, I was quite surprised by this. I know that the Cold Lake Air Weapons Range is a massive area, but I didn't realize it's well over a million hectares uh, where control efforts are completely impossible. So these are the types of things that we want to assess in terms of the potential to exacerbate spread across the province. Uh, we also want to model the potential to create a beetle-proof landscape through a targeted removal of pine. So it's interesting that uh, there is the healthy pine strategy uh, that's being implemented in Alberta uh, to greater and lesser degrees, depending upon where it's actually been embraced. Um, the question that we had is whether or not we could actually modify that in some way to produce a landscape that may or may not be uh, more or less uh, likely to promote mountain pine beetle spread. And so we're going to combine MPB spread with percolation theory uh, to see if we can characterize the degree to which a landscape is connected from the perspective of mountain pine beetle colonization. So effectively our goal would be then to consider whether or not we have the capacity uh, to... I'm a little nervous about flashes in front of Keith's eyes, you know. <laughs> Uh, but to, to create landscapes that have breaks in them. Uh, and if these landscapes have potential breaks, they might actually be barriers to uh, mountain pine beetle spread, assuming there are no beetles to the east of that, uh, uh, based upon this assessment. So ultimately, that's where we're going in, the, in our final phase. Uh, and with that, um, I simply want to wrap it up by saying thanks to all the people who have helped out. So thank you very much. <laughs>